Let the rider lay up. Let the rider lay up. Up in the morning with the rising sun. Up in the morning with the rising sun. Gonna jump in my Amtrak and have me some fun. Gonna jump in my Amtrak and have me some fun. With my 50 by my side. With my 50 by my side. Gonna put it in gear and go for a ride. Gonna put it in gear and go for a ride. Left, right, or lay up. 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 We love to double time. Good afternoon, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hauser, the CO of the Salt Amphibian School Battalion, and welcome to the World War II Korea LVT Museum here at Camp Pendleton. And throughout the DVD, you'll see footage of archival footage from the battles in the Pacific. You'll hear oral histories given from the Marines who were there. They've been collected by the historical branch at Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. We're proud to bring this to you and hope that you'll learn something from it. And hopefully you'll come out and visit us here at Delmar. There's a Marine. Two. Name is Holman. Three. He's a motivator. Uh, one. There's a Marine. Two. Name is Ski. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tom Adamitz, and I'm the director of the World War II Korea LVT Museum. Today we're going to take you on a tour of this museum where you're going to see the six amphibious tractors that were used by the United States Marine Corps from Guadalcanal through the Incheon Landing in Korea. We'll take you through each individual tractor from the LVT-1, which is located right behind me here, to the LVT-2, the LVT-1A1, the LVT-4, the LVT-3C, and the A5, the LVT-A5. These tractors represent a significant segment of Marine Corps history. They are vehicles that were created by accident, one might say, simply because a gentleman by the name of Donald Roebling back in the early 1930s went about creating a vehicle that could rescue victims of hurricanes and plane crashes in the Florida Everglades. Now Donald Roebling designed his vehicle primarily to rescue civilians that uh, were stranded in these natural disasters. But by a quirk of fate, Roebling's invention, the alligator, came to the attention of the Marine Corps through a 1937 Life magazine article. Now, in that magazine article, Roebling described how his vehicle could move through water, move on land, move through swampy areas, and it came to the attention of the Marine Corps that during that period of time, they were looking for a uh, means by which they could improve their amphibious capabilities. Mainly, they wanted to be able to move Marines from ship to shore on coral-surrounded atolls. And at that time, the Marines would essentially make their amphibious landings by bringing their ships in close to the uh, island objective and then using motor launches to move from ship to shore. The problem being that the only way you could move these launches across these coral reefs was to wait for the tidal conditions to be correct. Now, that gave a, a significant advantage to the defenders. So the Marines, in looking at Roebling's invention, decided that this vehicle might be the type of means by which they could move those troops from ship to shore without having to wait for the tidal conditions to be correct. Donald Roebling's invention, the Alligator, was a unique vehicle. Now, while it was not designed to be utilized as a weapon of war, the Marines took a very specific interest in this vehicle because of its cargo-carrying capabilities, but more so its ability to move through different types of terrain. And Roebling, unfortunately, did not have the manufacturing capabilities. The Marines wanted this, this vehicle. Roebling designed it for them. But a company called Food Machinery Corporation was the actual manufacturer. Now, the vehicle went into production in the summer of 1941. And the first vehicle rolled off the assembly lines down in Clearwater, Florida, in July of 1941. And as we know, five months later, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and we were indeed in a battle in the Pacific. The Alligator, or LVT-1, was the military variation of Donald Roebling's original Alligator. Now, this vehicle weighed 16,000 pounds. It could carry up to 20 troops inside its cargo compartment. It moved through the water at approximately 5 miles an hour, and on land it could do 15 miles an hour. The cleats were manufactured out of steel, and they were attached to what we could be considered an oversized bicycle chain. And it was powered by a Hercules gasoline engine. And the first time this vehicle was used in a combat environment was at Guadalcanal in 1942. At Guadalcanal, the Marines did not use the LVT, which, by the way, is, stands for Landing Vehicle Tracked. 
The Marines wanted to use the LBT as a first wave front line assault vehicle. The only problem was that the LBT armor, or lack thereof, was not really sufficient to stop the caliber of weapons that the Marines would be facing when they assaulted beaches. So at Guadalcanal, they utilized the LBT more as a logistics vehicle. In essence, they would carry in supplies using the LBT's cargo compartment, and then they would move the wounded back out to the hospital ships. The Marines went back to Donald Roebling and they said, design us something bigger, something stronger, and something that can withstand what we expect to be some withering fire coming from the Japanese defenses as we move on our march across the Pacific. He's a motivator. Uh, one. There's a Marine. Two. I'm standing in the cargo bay of an LVT-1 alligator. Now, as I had previously mentioned, the LVT-1 was designed primarily as a logistics vehicle, whereas you could carry your troops and your cargo in the space that's all around me. Interestingly enough, when Donald Roebling went about designing his alligator, Donald, Donald Roebling's original intention was to design a vehicle that could rescue victims of hurricanes and plane crashes in the Florida Everglades. But Donald Roebling took a look at the number of tourists that came down to the Florida Everglades each year from the Northeast, and he decided that his alligator could possibly become a money-making venture. He could take tourists on tours of the Everglades and the swamps. Thus, Roebling's alligator may very well have ended up being a tourist attraction in southern Florida instead of the legacy of the Marine Corps that it is today. Follow me. I am Marine Corps AAV. I am Marine Corps AAV. Hey. Uh, one. a Marine. Two. Name is Scott. Three. He's a motivator. Try to imagine yourself sitting inside the cab of this vehicle going in toward a heavily defended enemy beach. It was a pretty small cab. The ride was really bumpy, and the view, not quite like the view I have right now, was severely limited. The front of the cab was completely enclosed in an armor plate with a very small view slot that the driver could see through. And his vision, or his view of the beach, was severely limited, but he surely was well protected. A lefty ride right lay up. A lefty ride right lay up. A lefty ride right low. A lefty ride right low. My granddaddy was a horse marine. My granddaddy. To my left, we have a plaque that commemorates the Amtrakers from the 8th Amtrak Battalion. These Marines fought on the island of Peleliu in 1944. And listed on this plaque are the names of those Marines who gave the ultimate sacrifice. In one of the more interesting ironies, but still something that relates to the camaraderie and the history and the legacy of Amtrakers throughout the Marine Corps. Listed on this plaque is the name of Corporal Kevin T. Combe. Now, Corporal Combe is the grandson of a member of the 8th Amtrak Battalion who landed on Peleliu. And unfortunately, Corporal Combe lost his life in Iraq recently. And yet he is the grandson of a Marine, he is the son of a Marine. Three generations of Marines. Behind me is an LVT-2 water buffalo. Now this is the second generation of amphibious tractor, and this is a result of the Marine Corps asking Donald Roebling to build something larger, stronger, and more heavily armored. The LVT-2 was used for the first time at the Battle of Tarawa, and I'll talk about Tarawa in a moment here, but a little bit more about the LVT-2. The LVT-2 was a, a radical change in the design of the amphibious tractor. Radical in a sense that the original LVT-1 had straight cleats that powered it through the water. The LVT-2 went to what was known as double-cupped grousers, or shaped cups, that allowed it to move through the water at a greater rate of speed. Now, what is a greater rate of speed? Well, this would actually move the tractor through the water at about six miles per hour. Now, you might ask, how does one mile an hour more inc uh, increase? But in essence, the weight of this tractor, which was 26,000 pounds, was a 10,000 pound increase over the LVT-1. Another factor was the weight of the armor. Now, if you remember, I tapped that LVT-1, and it sounded about as thin as the fender on a car. The LVT-2, the armor was quarter-inch thick plating. Now, the Marines 
designated their tractors as LVTs, Landing Vehicle Tracked. The Navy quickly changed that designation to Liars, Vandals, and Thieves, simply because the Marines would beg, borrow, or steal any sort of metal, boilerplate, whatever they could get their hands on, to bolt, weld, affix to these vehicles in some fashion, to give them more protection. Now, the LVT-2 was powered by a seven-cylinder Continental radial aircraft engine, the same engine that powered fighter aircraft during World War II. And the way the vehicle was configured, the engine was in the rear of the tractor, with the drive shaft going right down the center of the tractor into the transmission, where a driver and an assistant driver sat on either side of it. To drive it, you simply put the vehicle into gear, held onto the two handbrakes, and released them. It allowed the vehicle to move forward. If you wanted to turn the vehicle, you would lock up one of the tracks, and it would pivot the vehicle to the right or pivot the vehicle to the left. On Iwo, we had the left flank beach, I think it was Beach 1, right under Mount Suribachi. And my company, we had a demonstration landing at Saipan on the way from Guam up to Iwo and, and met the people that we were going to be working with, which 5th Marine Division for a change. Uh, and. Uh, the company that put the flag up on Iwo was the company that went up with us. Dave Severance was the company commander, and of course he's, he's mentioned quite a bit in Flags of Our Fathers. And George Schreier was the company executive officer. He played himself in the John Wayne movie, Sands of Iwo Jima. Uh, and, and, and he was a fine Marine. Uh, George had to bunk above mine on the way up, so we got to know them a little bit. Then uh, we, we landed them and stayed on that beach and worked out of that beach once the landing took place. And on D plus four, Jim Norton, my company executive officer, and Dan Benwell, who was our company gunnery sergeant, were with me as we watched Schreier lead the patrol up Suribachi. And the, the, the uh, artillery was firing point blank range on the mountainside, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't far. And of course, that's not a very big eminence anyway. And we saw the flag go up at close range. Uh, it's still. It's still a uh, moving experience. It, of course, the, the first flag was up. Then, then we saw a motion around and saw the flag come down. And this is when Joe Rosenthal took that shot. And of course, in an instant, you know, and that world famous thing. And then those guys being killed, the uh, young men so soon afterwards. Uh, but those were some of the things that stood out to me. There's a Marine, two, name is Tracy, three, he's a motivator. The LBT-2, the vehicle that cut its teeth at Tarawa, as a matter of fact, the amphibious tractors came into their own at the Battle of Tarawa. Tarawa was significant in Marine Corps history because it was the first major combat operation that involved the use of amphibious tractors in a full frontal assault against the heavily defended beachhead. The Battle of Tarawa was centered on the island of Basio, an island that was slightly over two miles long by 800 yards wide. And on this large segment of coral and sand were 5,000 Japanese defenders. Intelligence reports Aerial reconnaissance and interviews with previous residents determined the following facts about Beshio. Beshio itself is about two and a half miles long and an average of eight to 1,200 yards wide, tapering at its eastern end to a long, narrow spit. The northern side faces the lagoon. The western and southern sides face the open sea. The island is surrounded by a shelving reef with a slope from the edge to the high water mark of about one foot. To the south, 
the slope increases somewhat and the reef becomes rockier. On this shore, the reef is about six or 700 yards wide. On the west, about 1,500 yards. To the north, it is 500 yards wide, extending to 1,500 yards at the northwest tip. Prevailing winds in this region were from the east to the northeast, providing a difficult sea for landing craft on the seaward side. But on the lagoon side, good weather was assured in everything except the westerly. Although the lagoon could provide good anchorage, practically free of coral heads, and its entrance could take ships of 17 feet draft, tidal conditions were such that there were only six days out of the month during which landings would be practicable. Tidal information was sketchy and incomplete but it was generally conceded that the rise and fall of the tide at the Neap was five feet and at the spring, six feet. It was not ascertained how much of the fringing reef would be exposed at low tide, but there was assurance from the masters of small craft who had sailed these waters that the normal Neap tide of four feet would allow access to the beach for landing craft. Aerial reconnaissance sorties flown on the 18th and 19th of September secured these photographs of the island's installations. They revealed a heavy concentration of defensive works on Beshio. The landing strip was, of course, the most prominent feature. But the backbone of the defensive armaments consisted of four 8-inch guns and two twin emplacements. One pair at the southwest corner of the island and were on the southeastern shore coast. There were also two pairs of 140 millimeter coast defense guns, one pair on the northwest and the other pair on the extreme eastern end of the island, and a number of dual purpose anti-aircraft of caliber upward of 75 millimeter on twin mounts. Around the edge of the island, the Japanese had built a tank trap consisting of a wide, steep-sided ditch covered by interlocking bands of fire from machine guns and heavy caliber automatic weapons in covered positions. Inland of this tank trap, the entire island was dotted with blockhouses of the heaviest construction, concrete and steel cupola type pillboxes, and covered machine gun nests built of block coral. These had well-established fields of fire and all were connected by a system of trenches to scattered, concealed foxholes. An apron of barbed wire, 50 to 100 yards offshore, practically surrounded the island. A the entanglement was two or three rows in depth. To the west were fish traps and other anti-boat obstacles contrived of coral and coral heads. On the south side of Beshio, there was a partly submerged barrier consisting of coconut logs placed in concrete on the coral with three rails of logs placed between them. In considering the most likely beach on which to effect initial landings, it was decided that the heaviest anti-boat obstacles and the heaviest beach defenses were concentrated on the southern shore of the island, with the exception of a fairly neutral area behind this coconut log barrier. Also, any approach to this beach could be taken in flank by fire from two directions, as our troops were not in enough force to cover the entire front. On the west, the inner reef was so far from the beach that assault troops would be forced to wade an inordinate distance under fire. The north or lagoon side of the island was chosen for the and coral heads offered a possible risk. The conditions for debarkation were generally better. Moreover, it was anticipated that tactical use could be made of the pier that jutted out into the lagoon. The Japs had thinned out much of the natural growth, so that the beaches offered no cover for attacking troops. Against those 5,000 Japanese defenders, the Marines brought over 15,000 Marines. On Saturday morning, November the 20th, 1943, the assault of Basio began. In the first wave were 42 LVTs. 
Prior to making the assault on Basio, the Navy had softened up that island with over 300,000 tons of munitions. They had pounded the island so heavily that they had told the Marines, you'll be back by noon chow, because nothing could have survived that bombardment. Naval craft and aviation delivered the scheduled gunfire and airstrikes a few hours before 0900 which time had been finally set as H hour due to the changing of the transport area. The large support group, including battleships and hundreds of aircraft, laid down almost 2,700 tons of explosives, 50 pounds per square yard of land surface. The preparation fire succeeded in knocking out all of the coast defense guns, the entire wire communication system, the anti-aircraft guns, and a few of the anti-boat guns, as well as all enemy aircraft and exposed personnel. Practically none of the beach defenses was damaged, however, nor were the deep emplacements, bunkers, caliber 30 machine guns, 37 millimeter anti-boat guns, or well-covered riflemen. Air reconnaissance provided valuable last-minute intelligence to the landing team commanders as to the conditions of beach defenses. installations obscured specific targets so that point fire had to cease. Area fire... What they didn't realize was that the Japanese defenses were configured in such a way that many of the shells that struck Basio literally glanced off the island and landed on the other side. The Japanese had bunkers that were in some cases up to 15 feet thick made of concrete, sand, palm logs. And the 5,000 Japanese defenders were Japanese troops that fought by the code of Bushido. They literally would die with the emperor's name on their lips. It was going to prove to be a tough battle for the Marines, but they would overcome it. It would take them 76 hours of utmost savagery, but they would succeed at Tarawa. At Tarawa, there were 125 amphibious tractors. There were 75 LVT-1s and 50 of the brand new LVT-2. The first wave crossed the line of departure at 0900 on November the 20th, 1943, 42 tractors strong. As they made their run into the beach, they were taking fire from the enemy, and as they churned up toward the coral reef that was 800 yards out from the actual landing beaches, they started to suffer losses. The enemy fire subsided momentarily because the enemy believed that these vehicles approaching the reef were standard landing craft and the Japanese defenders knew that the, the water level above the reef was such that the craft should bottom themselves out. Much to their surprise, the boats with wheels, as the Japanese designated these LVTs, turned over the reef, dropped into the lagoon, and continued their run into the beachhead. As they made it ashore, and when I say made it ashore, actually 27 of those first 42 tractors were still running as they made it into the beach, they came across 10 yards of sand and a five-foot-high seawall. And as they tried to climb that seawall, the Japanese guns were right behind the wall, fully depressed, cutting the bottoms out of the tractors. None of the tractors could climb over that wall. The Marines piled out of the tractors and got up underneath that seawall, and the Japanese defenders dug in and the Marines dug in. Now, the second wave of troops was coming in in the standard landing craft, and as they came up onto the reef, they bottomed out and the infantry had to climb out of those boats and wade in that lagoon toward that beachhead under witherous fire. Now they were suffering heavy casualties as they were moving in toward the beach. The surviving amphibious tractors backed off the wall, went into the lagoon, pulled the Marines in and ferried them into the beach. And by nightfall the Marines had a tenuous foothold on the island of Basio. Admiral Shibasaki, the commanding officer of the Japanese garrison on Basio, had boasted that a million men in a thousand years would never take Tarawa. It took the Marines 76 hours. At the end of that 76-hour period, of the 5,000 Japanese defenders, only 17 survived. The Marines lost over 1,000 killed, 2,000 wounded. Now try to think of that. Try to think in terms of Basio was no bigger than the parking lot around a football stadium. 
As those first 42 tractors were making the run in toward the beach, the lead tractor was number 49, an LBT-1, driven by PFC Ed Moore from Texas. Now, Ed was just a young man of 18, and he was making that assault on Tarawa, and as he looked out that gun slit on his LBT-1, Ed used to tell me the one thought that came into his mind was a song, an old cowboy song he had remembered from down home in Texas, and it was called, I'm Heading for the Last Roundup. And Ed sang that song as his tractor was crossing into that lagoon. Ed's tractor survived the run to the beach. As a matter of fact, it was the first tractor to touch down on the tip of Basio Island. The waves had been formed, and we were uh, traveling uh, on a, the line of departure from east to west. And when we got to a, a Navy ship called Pursuit, had been stationed uh, at the Bird's Beak end of the island, and when he gave us the signal, or the LCVP that was uh, leading us, uh, the word to make a left flank movement and head for the beach, then that's what we did. And it was immediately after we made our left flank movement that uh, the Japs started really opening up uh, on the line of vehicles going in. There was three different waves, about 300 yards apart. And they started throwing everything in the world at us that they had, 13 millimeters, 40 millimeters, uh, uh, three and four inch uh, boat guns and stuff like that. So it got pretty hectic, you know, this going in. I had 20 uh, infantrymen in, and I'm almost certain they were from the 2nd Platoon, 2nd Bat 2nd. That's 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marine. Unfortunately, Ed's tractor did not last very long on Basio. As he tried to climb the wall, his vehicle was literally disabled by enemy machine gun fire. And Ed, miraculously, did not suffer any wounds while all that fire was hitting his vehicle. Well, the first thing we did, we had to climb over a, a, a reef that was about five or 600 yards out. And once we got over that reef, we were still floating it because it, this gradually petered out uh, from uh, uh, floatable depth until the tracks hit the, the coral. And uh, the troops, we wasn't hit at all uh, going in, but there's a little spit of sand about maybe 100 yards off from the bird's beak that we had to cross. And once we got on it, then the, the machine gun bullets of 13 millimeters started hitting in the cab area. And uh, uh, I had a radio operator named uh, Gus Thornson that was alongside uh, me on, on my left side. And uh, uh, I looked at him and I told him to get low and get under his radio uh, so that he wouldn't be hit. The, we were under radio silence anyway. And I says that we've only got a short time to go now. And uh, I says that so far we're doing pretty good. And uh, we went on to the beach, and although uh, we knew that we was being shot at, I could see bullets hitting in front of me out of my little peephole. And uh, some of them hit the vehicle and went through, and, uh, but our main damage came when I hit the beach and went up to the seawall. The buck sergeant in charge of these troops told my platoon sergeant, who was also my uh, crew chief, his name was... Uh, platoon Sergeant Lester H. Harrison, and he says, I want him to go over the seawall and go inland. So I told Harrison that was relating these things to me that I heard him and he should get down, uh, you know, from the line of fire. And I eased up on the seawall, and as soon as I did, another machine gun opened up and uh, bullets were coming in the cab. One of the first ones that came through the cab hit this buck sergeant in the neck, and more blood was just spurting everywhere. And uh, the second one or that I can uh, recall uh, soon after that, uh, one of the 13 millimeters went under my right leg, and I had my rifle and Tackerberry's rifle right alongside of me, and one of these bullets came through and broke both of our weapons right in half. And uh, so that left us without a weapon, you know, once we got out of the vehicle and onto the beach. That's one of the things that Thoris and I years later talked about. Neither one of us uh, understand how we got out of that vehicle after coming ashore, going up on the seawall, and all these bullets 
flying all around us that we weren't hit, uh, wounded or anything. So he jumped out of his tractor and he assumed the position with the rest of the Marines up underneath that wall. And unfortunately, it wounded Ed pretty severely, so his day at Tarawa ended. And then about, I was probably uh, uh, on the beach maybe an hour and a half, less than two hours, and there was a, one of the infantry guys had his left kneecap blown off, and I was putting a bandage on his knee to stop the blood flowing so sand and the stuff wouldn't get into it. And as soon as I finished tying that uh, uh, knee up, a mortar shell hit right in back of me and it hit me in the shoulder and in the rear end. And I found out later on that the turtle uh, helmet that I had on kept dropping over my eyes. And I had just reached up and pushed that helmet back to cover the nap of my neck and so I could, uh, you know, see what I was doing with this wounded Marine. And when this mortar shell hit, and about maybe a half hour, or an hour later, a friend of mine saw me with this helmet on and says, what in the world is that in the back of your helmet? And I took it off and there's a piece of shrapnel about two inches in diameter logged in my camouflage uh, uh, cover that I had on and uh, made a big dent in, in that helmet. But if I hadn't have pushed it back at the same time it exploded, it would have hit me right in the nap of the neck and I wouldn't be sitting here talking today. Well, this machine gun that when I uh, went up on the wall, it knocked out all of the instrument panel wiring, the dashboard wiring. And of course, I didn't know that at the time. That was found out uh, later on that night when a maintenance crew came by and uh, uh, saw what had happened. They got rid of the radio so that they could work on the wiring and they got it ready and uh, uh, the next day it was out operating. But I, myself, within two or three hours after being wounded, I was evacuated off the beach and uh, the next day on D plus uh, one, the vehicle went back into service uh, from the wiring uh, repair job and wound up on the junction of Red Beach one and Red Beach two, uh, where it rests to this day. It's still there alongside of an LVT two Buffalo that was knocked out in that same area. But Ed to this day claims the, the, the honor of being the first Marine to touch down on Tarawa. The battle for Taro was costly for both sides. While the Japanese defenders were, were taken out almost to a man, almost 5,000 of them killed. The Marines lost over 1,000 killed and 2,000 wounded. Now we're talking almost 8,000 men on an area that's no bigger than a parking lot around a football stadium. The losses were very, very severe for both sides. One of the, matter of fact, the battalion commander for the 2nd Amphibious Tractor Battalion, Major Henry Drews, leading his battalion ashore, was killed before his tractor ever reached the beach. After the Battle of Tarawa, the casualties were severe, not only to men, but to the vehicles. Of the 125 tractors that were utilized at Tarawa, 90 were destroyed. Tarawa was of strategic importance to the United States in that it was the first group of islands as part of the Central Pacific Campaign. The main objective on the island of Basio was an airstrip, which would allow the United States to project its air power even further as it climbed up the islands toward the Japanese homeland. The battle on Basio was savage. Men wailed on each other with guns, knives, flamethrowers. They battled to the death. Why was this island so important? Again, it was going to be the stepping stone, actually the first step, to move through the Gilberts, move to the Marshalls, move into the Marianas, and move into the Japanese home island. At Tarawa, the utilization of the LVT-1 and LVT-2 proved to be vital to the Marines' amphibious operation. One of the lessons that was learned at Tarawa was that the vehicles that were lucky enough, and I say lucky enough because they were under withering fire as they were coming ashore, the vehicles that were lucky enough to survive that run into the beach, the infantry still had to climb over the sides of the vehicles and expose themselves to fire. It didn't take long for the Japanese defenders to determine where to zero in their machine gun and mortar fire. So thus, the troops had a double-edged sword. They survived the run to the beach. Now they have to survive the exiting of that vehicle. Okay. 
in your tanks and follow me. Jump in your tanks and follow me. I am Marine Corps AAV. I'm standing in the turret of an LVT 1A1, an armored amphibian. Now, if you remember earlier, I talked about how the infantry had the double challenge of surviving the run ashore and then surviving exiting the vehicle. The LVT 1A1 was designed for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to accompany the troop carrying LVTs and lay down suppressive fire. Suppressive fire is a Marine Corps euphemism for making the other guy duck. These armored amphibians with Stuart tank turrets affixed to a water buffalo hull, a 37 millimeter cannon, a machine gun port, 230 caliber machine guns on either side of the turret. They would provide that suppressive fire, and then once ashore, the vehicle would serve as a mobile artillery platform to support the infantry while they were on the ground. What well, one should try to imagine, and I'm in the year 2004, and I'm a pretty big guy. There were two men inside of this turret. Their vision was rather limited, it was incredibly hot, and as they moved into the beach, they were taking fire as well as providing fire of their own. Join me as I climb inside this turret and take a view of the beach. Now, as we were making our run toward the beach, and we're getting closer to where we're starting to take enemy fire, I think it's about time that we batten down the hatches. This is not an easy fit, mind you. I'm not the size of a World War II Marine. And they would probably do this a lot faster with incoming fire. All right. I've squeezed on down inside the gun compartment. Now, my view down here is severely limited. I can see out a vision hole straight ahead. I also have a vision block in front of me. Now, on either side of me, I've got another Marine, and that Marine is operating this gun system along with me. And we're having shells passed up underneath. We're loading them in and we're firing. Try to imagine the recoil and the noise that was going on inside this turret as they were firing this weapon. He picked his teeth with the gun on stick. He picked his teeth with the gun on stick. Hello, I lay up. Hello, I lay up. Left to right, lay up. Left to right, lay up. Hello. I'm standing in the cargo bay of an LVT-4, the largest of the World War II era tractors. Now, the LVT-4 was designed as part of the natural evolution of amphibious tractors to provide the Marine Corps with another capability as they made an assault on a Japanese-held island. The LVT-4, its main claim to fame, was simply that it was the first vehicle that had a rear ramp installed on it. And that rear ramp allowed the infantry to egress out of the back of the vehicle. It would give them some protection from the withering fire that they received once they landed ashore. Now the LVT-4 cargo compartment was large enough to carry up to 25 fully combat loaded Marines. So as you're looking at me, try to imagine myself with 24 of my best friends, all fully loaded with combat gear, cramped down inside this vehicle, actually huddled down inside this vehicle. Also, the cargo compartment was large enough that they could carry a small Jeep or they could carry one or two 75 millimeter pack howitzers. Now, as I mentioned, this was the workhorse of the amphibious tractors during World War II. Matter of fact, they built over 8,000 of these vehicles. Today, there are still several hundred of the vehicles in operation throughout the world and used in stone quarries, helping to fight forest fires. So it's a very versatile tractor. I'm standing on the rear ramp of an LVT-3C. C stands for covered. As you can see, this vehicle has a covered cargo compartment. Now, during World War II, the LVT-3 was not a covered vehicle. As a matter of fact, it didn't become covered until after World War II. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. But the LVT-3 was designed for one purpose and one purpose only. And that was to support the invasion of the Japanese home islands in the fall of 1945. Now, what made the LVT-3 so unique and different as compared to all the other Amtraks is that the LVT-3 was the only vehicle that had two engines used to power it. Now, whereas all of the other amphibious tractors, with the exception of the LVT-1, used seven-cylinder Continental radial aircraft engines, the LVT-3 used two Cadillac V8 engines, 
one located in each one of its sponsons. The LVT-3, while designed and developed to support the invasion of the Japanese home islands in the fall of 1945, was utilized for the first time at the Battle of Okinawa in April of 1945. The vehicle worked as well as the designers had hoped and they were looking forward to utilizing this vehicle to support the invasion of the Japanese home islands. Now, at the end of World War II, with almost 3,000 of these vehicles having been built, military planners were thinking ahead and they believed that World War III, as they saw it, would more than likely be an atomic conflict. Now, in an atomic conflict, they wanted to provide some sort of protection for the infantry that was inside this vehicle. Subsequently, they built a cover over the top of the vehicle to give the troops some sort of protection against an atomic blast. Now, the carrying capacity of the LVT-3 was similar to the other Amtraks. You could put 20 infantrymen inside this cargo compartment. Now, again, the uniqueness of the vehicle was that it had two engines. In a sense, redundant systems. If one engine broke down, the other engine could still power the vehicle and it's run into shore. As a matter of fact, in this museum, we actually drove this tractor that you see here into the museum on one engine. Unfortunately, the engine died on us about halfway into the museum. We had to push it the rest of the way. But not bad for an engine that had not started for almost 35 years. At the end of World War II, the LBT-3 was covered. It found more use during the Korean conflict. As a matter of fact, the LVT-3 was the primary workhorse for the Marines during Korea and was utilized at the landings at Incheon. I'm perched upon an LVT A5. Now the A5 is the big brother of the A1, which we talked about earlier. Now you might wonder, we've already talked about the LVT-1, the LVT-2, the A1, the LVT-3, and the LVT-4. Now, the A-5 in sequence was a vehicle that was originally designated as an A-4. The difference between the A-4 and the A-5 was simply in this gun platform. In the A-4, it, it was a firm fixed gun platform. In the A-5, it was a gyroscopically stabilized gun platform. The only real difference. Now, the A-5 was used primarily the same as the A-1. In the run into the beach, the A-5 would provide suppressive fire, and then once ashore, it would provide a mobile artillery platform for the infantry. The difference being, in the A-5, they used a 75-millimeter snub-nosed howitzer compared to that 37-millimeter that resided in the A-1. The A-5 was used primarily in the latter stages of World War II and then extensively during the Korean conflict. Well, folks, that completes our tour of the World War II Korea LVT Museum. We hope you've enjoyed this tour, and we hope you've gained a little insight into what the Marines did in these amphibious tractors during World War II and Korea. On site here at the Assault Amphibian School, where the LVT Museum is located, we train today's Amtrakers. We train them in the same grounds and the same water that the Marines who landed at Tarawa, Peleliu, and Iwo Jima at Incheon landed. And so there's a legacy here that goes far beyond just these vehicles that are in this museum. The young Marines that come through our doors today get the opportunity to touch their past. They get the opportunity to learn about that 18-year-old Marine who waded ashore at Tarawa or who scaled Mount Suribachi. And that is a priceless legacy for these young Marines to learn, and it is a benefit to the school, the Marine Corps, and the United States as a whole. I thank you for coming to the museum, and I'm Tom Adametz director of the World War II Korea LVT Museum, Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, California. Semper Fi. Well, good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your tour of the museum. I hope you found it interesting, but I hope you learned something. Take an opportunity to come visit us. Please uh, stop by Camp Pendleton, take a tour in person, sign the guest book before you leave, and uh, we appreciate your support. I left you right and lay up. I left you right and lay up. I left you right and low. I left you right and low. My granddaddy was a horse marine. My granddaddy was a horse marine. Everything you wore was Marine Corps green. Everything you wore was Marine Corps green. He ate his steaks eight inches thick. He ate his steaks eight inches thick. He picked his teeth with the god on stick. He picked his teeth with the god on stick. 
Hello, where I lay up. Hello, where I lay up. Left you where I lay up. Left you where I lay up. Hello, where I lay up. Hello, where I lay up. Left you where I low. Left you where I low. Pain. Pain. In my legs. In my legs. I don't care. I don't care. I put it there. I put it there. Pain. Pain. In my knees. In my knees. I don't care. I don't care. I put it there. I put it there. Pain. Pain. In my back, in my back, I don't care, I don't care, I put it there, I put it there, pain, pain, in my neck, in my neck, I don't care, I don't care, I like it there, I like it there. Hey, baby, what are you doing? What are you doing? Jump in your ships and follow me. Jump in your ships and follow me. I am Marine Corps AAV. I am Marine Corps AAV. Hey, Army. Hey, Army. Where are you going? Where are you going? Jump in your tanks and follow me. Jump in your tanks and follow me. I am Marine Corps AAV.